First of all, let me say that I'm going to say a dirty word. Okay. When I came up in school, they still allowed corporal punishment. Gasp. <laughs> Yeah, but now I'm sitting in the faculty meeting with the same people that used to beat me. So it was, it was, it was weird, um, you know, but um, I love, I love, absolutely love education, ladies and gentlemen. I think that being an educator, those of you who have done your time in the classroom, is a true labor of love. It is not like corporate America at all. You know, you can't just cut it off. You go home at the end of the day with those children on your heart. So uh, at this time, I'm going to share a piece called Love. Just follow me, okay? Now listen, I need to know that you're listening to what I'm saying, so if I say something that you like, you snap your fingers, everybody snap your fingers. Excellent. And for those of you sitting up here, you can tap the table. Okay, cool. We're on the same page. Here we go. <clears throat> I love the love, and lately I've been feeling like love's in need of love. So much hate, I suffocate trying to breathe of love. I keep my hand on the plow, trying to sow seeds of love, hoping they blossom beautifully where the weeds once was, because I feel that love's in need of a love so much that for me to show love is imperative. So poetically, I profusely pour love into this narrative, informative. Expose, persuasive, love-related poetry by which I hope you all are persuaded to love. Love intricately, love intimately, intuitively, all-inclusively. Extend your love to someone. Love someone exclusively. Love to be affectionate. Love to kiss. Love to touch. Find someone that doesn't love themselves enough and love that person too much. To me, love is like oxygen. I simply cannot breathe without it. And I'm so madly in love with love that I'm happy to be mad about it, glad to be mad about it, emphatically ecstatic about it. And if you've ever experienced love, you know that love has a magic about it. Why, if I can measure love in time, I would seek to become timeless with the passing of every minute. And if I could swim in love, I would go so deep that it would be possible for me to drown in it because true love is not shallow. You have to get deep down in it and submerge yourself in love large enough for the universe to spin around in it. I was told that love is blind, so sometimes I love blindly, because if you love me at 10%, it's only right that I love you back at 90. Some days, you'll have to love me at 90, because I can only supp supply 10. But it's cool, because you're my partner, my ace, my classmate, my best friend, but then make no mistake, love does take work. Every day won't be easy, there will be drama, but I'm talking about that 50 year anniversary love, like Papa love grandmama, see? That kind of love endures, and that kind of love matures, and that kind of love is unconditional, reciprocal, and reassures that love will save the day, and love will be your crutch. And if no one has told you today, let me say that I love you all this much. Thank you. Thank you. The kids were taking a test, uh, a science test, when I was teaching sixth grade science when I wrote that. I don't, I don't understand the connection, but hey, that's where I was. Uh, when I was younger, I would uh, go home and I would say things to my mother like, I don't think that that lady likes me. <laughs> and my mother uh, would, would go in, you know, look here, little boy. <laughs> that grown woman is not worried about, you know, and it would just, it would be crazy. You know, I, I felt like my feelings were invalid, you know what I mean, with my mom, so I never brought it up again. But after I got to education, and I was privy to the conversations in the teacher's lounge. I learned that some of the teachers absolutely do not like some of the students that they deal with. Hey, you know, it's just all honesty. And um, what I, I began to do, uh, ladies and gentlemen, you're going to need this. And I don't know, did everybody get a gift bag? Oh, just me? Ha, <laughs> don't worry about it. Uh, but I have a journal in my gift bag. I'm, I'm excited about that journal. Because what I began to do, uh, I would journal my experiences every day through poetry. Um, you know, we have feelings too, but a lot of times it doesn't seem like the parents get that. So I wrote a poem, what 
about what parents, I mean, about what teachers would say to parents, but can't say to parents if we want to stay employed. So, um, yeah, it, it's an exercise. At this time, I just want to say that the views expressed by myself are not that uh, of University of Houston, uh, uh, the College of Education, or first lecture. Is that cool? I got it. Okay. <laughs> so, um, poem goes like this. It's called <laughs> somebody's phone. Somebody. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, poem goes like this. It's called "Before the First Bell Rings." Okay. <clears throat> before your kids get ready for school, before your kids leave, before your kids get on the bus, before you reach for your keys. Before your kids set foot in the school, before you do a thing, from teacher to parent, let's get some things established before the first bell rings. First, I need a good contact number on you, your cell phone, your home, or where you work. In the event of an emergency, what am I supposed to do if your child gets hurt? I'm not a bill collector or a bugaboo. Give me the wrong phone number for what? Let's get it understood. Let it be established. You should the teacher and parent need to stay in touch. We feed your child. Go the extra mile. Backward, we would bend. But just like we're supporting you, we need some help from you on your end. Raising a child can be a work in progress and together any problem can be solved but the operative word in that sentence is together this year I need you to be involved instead you wait for something to happen you show up uninformed and go berserk in the office acting all country and ghetto throwing your hands and yelling at the clerks and then you run up in my classroom telling me what I'm supposed to do but the bottom line is I spend more time with your child than you do you don't want to be bothered at home you let them play video games and watch DVDs but please believe video games and DVDs won't teach them how to read and all that hooping and hollering and huffing and puffing about nothing will get you jacked you are the first example your child learns from now I see why they act the way they act cursing like they're grown because you curse them like they're grown make no mistake I have no say in what goes on at your home but as for me and the rest of the educators respect is a standard and no disrespect will be tolerated teach your child some manners teach your child something about their appearance and you might think this is rude, but stop coming to the school in that do rag, that house coat, and them house shoes. And I'm going to send a proxy report to report cards home. She wants to sign a return. Then you show up the last week of school asking me why your kid didn't learn, asking me why your kid didn't pass. Half the time they weren't in class, and the other half of the time they were tardy, because you were acting thirsty last night at the party. And on that note, let me remind you that truancy is a crime. I'll tell you once, I'll tell you twice, and I'm going to put the police in your life. So I hope you get the message. It's not to be ignored. Bell's about the ring. The assignment's on the board. Thank you. <laughs> are you guys okay over there? The people, the, the people from HISD are sweating. They're like, I mean, hey, it's, it's a little honesty, you know. Uh, but, you know, Boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, what I really want you to walk away with is that education is the foundation of it all. I began to change my perspective. Now, let me be honest about some things. I was the kind of person, or I was the teacher, who kind of got there with the kids. I know it's terrible. But in my maturity and realizing my position, I became the teacher that was there early and the last one to leave. I began to believe in my students and my profession so much that I was excited every morning to get up. Five o'clock in the morning, I'd get out of bed like this. <laughs> I'm telling you, I was so, <laughs> y'all have no idea. Listen. I felt like we, as educators, were superheroes. And we had the chance, the opportunity, to save the world every day in our classrooms. Y'all don't get it? OK. Yeah. I, uh, I liked it so much that I, I made a superhero uniform. So, so this is my, it's, it's old, it's faded. 
Can y'all see my superhero? No. Is this better? <laughs> now, you know, when you tell people, when you tell people you're in education, uh, usually a pity party starts. Hey, what do you do? Oh, I'm a teacher. Oh. You know, and I stopped people from talking to me like that because I was excited about what I did. So I said, man, you know, if I could change some people's perspective about education, maybe I could change how they function in the classroom. So I wrote this piece. It is simply entitled, I Teach, and it's like a superhero's creed for the classroom for first lecture to get you guys ready for the school year. Everybody repeat after me. Everybody say, I teach. Check it out. I was told, teachers aren't created, they are born. I am cut from a different fabric. I guess that's what makes me bona fide, certified. My classroom management is classic. Nonsense is never tolerated. Ignorance is eliminated. Illiteracy is literally a culture of the mentally incapacitated. I hate it. When students give up on themselves, I hate it when students quit before trying. Especially when cognitive thinking seems to be losing the battle and intelligence seems to be dying. So I come prepared for anything, ready to push them to their peak. I am the educator extraordinaire with these exquisite essentials I teach. I was told, those that can will do and those that can't will teach are you kidding me i do the impossible in my classroom most of you can't do me 180 lesson plans three objectives on the board bobby bonquisha hector and kim lynn all on the same accord that's 25 students in my classroom seven periods a day one period of two to three parent teacher conferences to make sure we're on the same page that's 195 students 15 to 25 parents a week and i don't accept excuses from either party involved parent or student i teach i make the profession look good on all levels they adore me. Elementary, middle, and high school. Alternative, charter, magnet, and Montessori. Students are watching what I do, so I don't take my appearance light. That's why I dress it up like a boss to show them what professionalism looks like. My ensemble is untouchable. My hair and shoes are on the one. It's hypocritical to tell students to dress professional if we don't show them how it's done. So you won't hear that speech about how poor I am or what I can't afford to purchase. So I step in my classroom looking like a bum. I'm doing my students a disservice. Give me lemons. I make fashionable lemonade. Refreshing and magnanimously tasty. Translation. I make thrift stores, Goodwill, Target, and Walmart look like Nordstrom, Saks, or Macy's. See, when you look good, you feel good. And when you feel good, the day can be sweet. So my students step in my classroom and look at me. I look like I came to teach. I teach like life, dependent on it. And incompetence is a cancer. So I'm an oncologist in my classroom and education is the answer. I teach with passion. I teach with purpose. I teach with wisdom because it's worth it. I teach like enlightenment is as timeless as classical music, so every note must be perfect. I'm just scratching the surface. Watch how quick I get deep. Middle of the day, prime instructional time, my principal doing walkthroughs stuck her head in to take a peek. Lights off. Students' heads were down. You couldn't hear a peep. I lay back in my seat, kicked up my feet. All my students were on point. This was a dream so sweet. My principal crept up close, but before she could speak, I said, do not interrupt my lesson. I am teaching in my sleep. I'm just playing. I'm just saying. I eat, sleep, and breathe education, and I don't have to fill a bus or fluff it up. You can look at my evaluations. I teach the bottom of the barrel. I teach the cream of the crop. Had a homeschool kid that was homeless, so I taught him on the block. Taught him to remove the mental blocks. We put it back together like blocks. I told him his mind was a treasure chest and it was time to pop the lock. Any medium I can mock, I can manipulate the clock. I find beauty in ambiguity so I teach outside the box. No pupil I can't reach. And as I close my speech, class, what's the main idea of this piece? I Thank you.